Georgia, a well-dressed man of Latin descent, entered the restaurant confidently, his blue wool blazer adding to his sophisticated appearance. Though he stood out among the patrons, he was there for an important meeting and knew the restaurant's reputation. As Georgie approached a terrace table, the maitre d' Austin intercepted him with a condescending tone, claiming the table was reserved. George pointed out the lack of a reservation sign, but Austin smugly returned with a reserved plaque, insisting the table was taken and offering another spot. Remaining calm, George mentioned that his associate likely reserved the table due to the meeting's significance, but he agreed to be seated elsewhere. As he moved aside, Austin eagerly escorted a newly arrived couple to a prime table, ignoring George. Austin then led Georgie to a small, inconvenient table near the kitchen entrance. The table was hastily set by servers, and George was soon jostled by a passing server who didn't apologize. Austin, assuming George was involved in illegal activities based on his appearance, quietly instructed Roger, the head waiter, to remove him. Though hesitant, Roger complied, approaching George with forced politeness and subtle mockery. As George's patience waned, he demanded to meet with the owner. Austin offered insincere apologies, but George refused to leave, hinting at repercussions once the owner learned of their behavior. Despite the other diner's awareness, no one intervened, and George stood his ground against the blatant discrimination. Feigning politeness, Austin suggested moving George to a VIP dining room for a better experience. George agreed on the condition of being served by a different waiter. Austin assured him of this and led him to a luxurious room. However, when Roger returned to take his order, George's frustration boiled over. I asked for a different waiter, he exclaimed. Roger, unfazed, replied, I'm the only one available, the others are just trainees. George, trying to remain calm, ordered lobster bis and filet mainin, only to be told they were out of both. Growing more irritated, he settled on salmon. Roger hesitated but eventually agreed, exiting the room to find Austin waiting. Without speaking, Austin locked the VIP room door and handed the key to Roger, indicating that they needed a new plan to get rid of George quietly. Inside the VIP room, George initially enjoyed the privacy, but as time passed and his wine glass emptied, his patience were thin. He approached the door, only to find it locked. Hey, what's going on? He shouted, banging on the door. Open this immediately. When there was no response, George became more agitated. Just as he was about to force the door open, it swung open, revealing Roger and two uniformed police officers who eyed George suspiciously. Roger spoke first, addressing the officers, this man has been causing a lot of trouble. We had no choice but to call you. George, eh, taken aback, quickly responded, officers, I'm glad you're here. These men locked me in this room against my will and have treated me horribly. I'm ready to press charges. Hold on, one officer interrupted. We're here because of a complaint against you for non-payment and causing a disturbance. What do you have to say? George, incredulous, protested. Non-payment? I haven't even received my food yet. These men locked me in here. Roger, unfazed, presented the officers with a bill. As you can see, he's racked up a considerable bill and refuses to pay. That's not my bill, George exclaimed. I've only had some wine, part of which was spilled on me. This is a setup. Roger, trying to maintain control, suggested, let's take this outside and sort it out. I'm not leaving until my business associate arrives, George said firmly. This has been a disaster from the start. The officer, no longer patient, stated, sir, we're going to have to take you in. You can make your statement at the station, but we need to act on the complaint now. Are you arresting me? George asked, shocked. I'm afraid so, the officer replied, pulling out handcuffs. As George was escorted through the restaurant, Richard, the owner, arrived and began a discussion with Austin. Noticing the commotion, Roger suddenly stopped and said, gents, maybe we should get the maitre d' involved. 
We'll need his statement. Good idea. The police officer agreed. We'll wait here for you. Roger hurried toward Richard and Austin. Catching Austin's eye, he subtly gestured toward the police officers in Georgia, who was still in handcuffs. Austin, quickly understanding, interrupted Richard mid-conversation, guiding him away with an excuse about checking the renovations in the kitchen. As they entered the kitchen, Austin highlighted the improvements, trying to keep Richard distracted. We've increased freezer storage by 30% and nearly doubled the prep areas. The new extraction fan is both quieter and more efficient. Richard nodded approvingly. Very good. It cost a fortune, but if it helps with the sale, it's worth it. I'm meeting the CEO of the Filet Factory soon. Is everything in order? I want this place perfect. Absolutely, sir, Austin replied. There was a minor issue with the customer, but it's handled. Good job, Richard said, satisfied. You've managed this well. A raise might be in your future. Thank you, sir, Austin said, relieved. Meanwhile, in the lobby, George turned to the officers. I believe I'm allowed a phone call, right? Technically, only from the station, the officer responded, but I'll make an exception. Make it quick. Thank you, George said, awkwardly retrieving his phone due to the handcuffs. He scrolled to a number and made the call. In the kitchen, Richard's phone buzzed. Excuse me, he said to Austin, I need to take this. Seeing the caller ID, his face lit up. It's him, he whispered to Austin before answering. Hello. George didn't waste time. We have a serious problem. How soon can you get to the restaurant? I'm already here. Richard replied, confused. For our meeting, of course. Come to the lobby immediately. I'm here too, in handcuffs. Your staff had me arrested, George explained. Arrested? What? Hold on. I'll be right out, Richard said, rushing out of the kitchen, with Austin trailing behind, baffled. Is there a problem, sir? Austin asked. There's a huge problem. Richard snapped. Tell me you didn't have anything to do with this. They reached the lobby, where the police, George, and Roger were waiting. What's going on here? Richard demanded, looking from Roger to Austin to the officers. Why is this man in handcuffs? Don't you know who he is? Roger spoke up. We definitely know who he is, sir. We stopped him before he could cause trouble. We know you don't want his type here. His type? What are you talking about? Richard asked, growing angrier. Drug dealers, pimps, illegal immigrants. Roger stammered, realizing he'd made a grave mistake. Drug dealers, illegal immigrants. Are you out of your mind? Richard roared. This man is the CEO of the Filet Factory, here to discuss acquiring this restaurant. Richard turned to Austin. Did you know about this? Were you involved? Austin stuttered. I, I thought. Enough. Richard cut him off, turning to the police. Officers, I'm so sorry for this misunderstanding. Please release him immediately. The officer in charge, visibly irritated, stepped forward and unlocked George's handcuffs. I don't know what kind of circus you're running here, but don't waste our time again, he warned. Richard, trying to smooth things over, said, please join us for a complimentary meal. Bring your wives, it would be our pleasure. We'll think about it, the officer muttered as they left. Turning to George, Richard said, George, I can't apologize enough for what you've been through. What do you have to say for yourself? He asked Austin. Austin looked devastated. I made a huge mistake, he admitted. George, fixing him with a stare, asked, if you'd known who I was, that I was wealthy and powerful, would you have treated me this way? Austin couldn't meet his gaze. No, sir, Roger confessed. So you judged me by my skin color? Georgie pressed. Neither man responded, too ashamed to speak. George turned to Richard. Their behavior was disgraceful. If I buy this restaurant, they'll be reassigned. Please, don't fire us. Roger pleaded, 
while Austin stood in silent agony. You're both fired, Richard declared. Collect your things and leave. Wait, George interjected. If I purchase this restaurant, they'll stay, starting as dishwashers. Take the day to reflect. Tomorrow you'll begin in a kitchen. Once management is satisfied with your rehabilitation, you'll move to cleaning. Cleaning? Austin echoed, shocked. Yes, Richard agreed, starting with the restrooms. If you quit, George added, I'll ensure you never work in this town again. Believe me, I have the power to make that happen. Richard instructed Austin and Roger to report to his office, then turned back to George. As they walked away, Richard asked Austin to have Chef Patrick prepare something special for the occasion. With their heads hung low, Austin and Roger left while George and Richard proceeded with their meeting, enjoying a fine meal and parting on positive terms. While checking on the restaurant later, Richard overheard a woman whispering about the incident. Did you see that man in handcuffs? She asked. Richard approached the couple, apologizing sincerely. I'm truly sorry for what happened today. It was a regrettable misunderstanding, he said. The woman looked at him with skepticism. A misunderstanding? It seemed more like discrimination. Richard, serious and remorseful, assured her, I understand, and we're taking this very seriously. We're conducting a thorough review to prevent this from happening again. The man at the table, slightly more forgiving, said that's a start, but it will take more than words to fix your reputation. Richard agreed, acknowledging the challenge. We're committed to making things right and fostering a more inclusive environment. As Richard continued speaking with other patrons, it was clear that the incident had tarnished the restaurant's reputation. He knew it would take time and significant effort to rebuild trust. In his office, Austin and Roger nervously awaited Richard. Austin, trembling, expressed deep regret for their actions. Richard, stern but fair, emphasized that while apologies were a start, real change was essential. He informed them they would undergo sensitivity training and that he would personally monitor their progress. As the meeting ended, Richard expressed hope that their efforts would help restore the restaurant's reputation. Austin and Roger left determined to make amends, aware of the challenging path ahead. Later, Richard called George to apologize again. George, I'm truly sorry for what happened. I admire your willingness to give my staff a second chance, he said. Georgia, appreciating the sincerity, had one condition. I want to see real changes in your policies and practices, committing to diversity and inclusion for all customers. Richard agreed without hesitation. Consider it done. We'll work hard to create a welcoming environment for everyone. With that agreement, George and Richard resumed their discussions about the restaurant sale working closely to ensure both a cultural and business transformation. In the following months, the restaurant implemented sensitivity training, adopted diverse hiring practices, and engaged with marginalized communities under George's guidance. The restaurant, once marred by controversy, transformed into a symbol of positive change. Recognized for its excellent cuisine and commitment to inclusivity and respect for all.